Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the 11th annual meeting of the Family History and Early Age Onset Colorectal Cancer Strategic Priority Team. For those who don't know me, I am Dr. Paul Schroy from the Boston University School of Medicine, and I've had the honor of serving as co-chair of, uh, of this group since its inception. Um, next slide, please. My esteemed co-chair, as you probably well know, is Heather Hample from the City of Hope National Cancer S uh, Center. Next slide, please. So today's agenda is outlined here. For the sake of time, we have decided to skip formal introductions, but would encourage any new members to briefly identify themselves and their organization in the chat. I'll first provide an overview of our team charge, guiding themes, and prior accomplishments. I'll then provide a brief recap of highlights from last year's meeting. We're then going to hear, a brief, uh, hear brief updates on several ongoing projects and 2022 accomplishments. And we'll then open things up for discussion with the ultimate goal of developing a action plan for the coming year. Next slide. The Family History Task Group was founded in 2012 due in large part to the insistence of the late Dr. Dennis Onan. We expanded our scope to include early onset colorectal cancer in 2016, thanks to the vision of the late Dr. Tom Weber. We were later rebranded as a strategic priority team in 2020. Our charge is to identify key issues and areas of need around familial, inherited, and early onset colorectal cancer for the purposes of identifying opportunity, opportunities for the roundtable to be a catalyst for change. Next slide, please. The key themes that have guided many of our activities include first helping clinicians develop a system-based approach to the identification and management of patients at familial and genetic risk, as well as the recommendation for early diagnostic evaluation of those presenting with signs or symptoms of colorectal cancer at any age. Second, improving electronic health records to help facilitate needed screening and or counseling recommendations for patients with a family history. Increasing clinician, patient and intrafamily communication about familial and inherited risk. Improving on-time screening according to recommended guidelines for both average and high-risk persons. And lastly, addressing the increase in colorectal cancer in young adults through strategic planning and interactions with key stakeholders and thought leaders. Next slide, please. Some of our key prior accomplishments are listed here. We hosted a family history symposium of experts in the field and key stakeholders in 2014, the proceedings of which were published in an article entitled, Understanding the Contribution of Family History to Colorectal Cancer Risk and Its Clinical Implications, a State of the Science Review, where Jan Lowry was the first author. We then hosted an electronic health record meeting in 2015 to develop a consensus statement, core components, and outline a uh, roundtable strategy uh, for improving family history collection in EHRs. We also hosted an early onset colorectal cancer summit in 2017, the proceedings of which were published in an article entitled, A Strategic Plan to Address the Rising Burden of Colorectal Cancer in Young Adults. And again, this was, uh, Jan Lowry was the uh, first author on that paper as well. And more recently, we developed the Comprehensive Risk Assessment and Screening Toolkit to facilitate detection of familial, inherited, and early onset colorectal cancer. Next slide. In addition to these activities, we've produced several resources and publications, which are shown here. I'm not gonna read through each one, but I'm sure you're familiar with many of these. Next slide. At last year's meeting, we heard updates on the lead time marketing research project, the Family History of Advanced Adenoma Early Age Onset Colorectal Cancer Study, the Young Onset Colorectal Adenoma or YOCA Study, and a request that the US Services Preventive Task Force would, uh, might consider a Lynch Syndrome Review. We'll hear new updates on several of these uh, projects today. We then broke into discussion groups focused on developing strategies for promoting the Risk Assessment and Screening Toolkit and Universal Tumor Screening for Lynch Syndrome. Next slide. These discussions provided the basis for this past year's activities. 
With respect to the risk assessment and screening toolkit, we propose to form a working group to consider expanding its scope to include other familial and inherited cancers, to survey the NCCRT membership to gather feedback about the toolkit and any dissemination, implementation, and or evaluation activities, and to explore opportunities for further dissemination. With respect to promoting universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome, we propose to achieve a Commission on Cancer accreditation standard to promote education at tumor registrars regarding microsatellite instability and immunohistochemistry for the causative mismatch repair proteins. Continue to support the AGA CAP proposed Medicare merit-based incentive payment measure around universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome and to support state and federal legislation to prevent life insurance discrimination based on genetic test results or family history. Next slide. I'm now going to turn things over to Heather to chair the next segment of our agenda. Heather, you're on. Thanks, Paul. Um, and maybe while we're here, I'll mention our um, two guests who will be joining us as well. Um, so Christine Momente will be presenting after me on the Family History of Advanced Adenoma, an early onset colon cancer study. And then Michelle Obertine will be presenting lead time messaging campaign, which many of you were involved in. Um, and she's from KSP Market and Research Consulting um, Company. Okay, so next slide. So we wanted to give you a few updates um, for 2022 and some of the progress that's happened um, despite sort of continuing to be remote with the pandemic um, through most of uh, the year. So um, we had, um, as the group knows, and as Paul mentioned before, um, NCCRT did um, submit um, among a large group of organizations a topic on Lynch syndrome to be considered by the US Preventive Services Task Force. And this is a topic specifically called Lynch syndrome, Lynch syndrome related cancers, risk assessment, genetic counseling, and genetic testing. So as many of you know, they have a hereditary breast ovarian cancer risk assessment guideline. And because of this, um, individuals who meet the criteria for um, genetic counseling and testing for HBOC with a uh, because it received a grade B or above recommendation, it's covered by insurance with no copay as part of the Affordable Care Act. So it's very important that we get the US Preventative Service Task Force to um, make a review uh, of Lynch syndrome risk assessment guidelines. Um, hopefully some of them will get a grade B or higher recommendation and then individuals who meet those family history criteria would get genetic counseling and testing without a copay as per the ACA. Um, so we had supported this nomination um, in 2021. And shortly after the meeting last year, um, we found out that it was accepted as a topic by USPSCF. Um, now, it's a first step and it may take years, but it's a move in the right direction. So we're really excited about it. Um, and it certainly will also raise awareness uh, about Lynch syndrome because these are guidelines that the primary care um, uh, physicians are, are well aware of. Um, and again, uh, with the no cost share piece for patients who qualify um, for counseling or testing, it would be a nice move forward. So. Um, it's a little out of our hands now, but um, it was really great that NCCRT supported the nomination. And it was the fact that so many organizations submitted this topic um, that it got selected. A second thing that we are working on um, with uh, our friends at Fight CRC is getting a Commission on Cancer accreditation standard around universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. So this was one of the initiatives you'll remember, I think Caleb had us do this idea where we wrote papers at our last in-person meeting, or maybe it was two ago. And um, we came up with some ideas that, and they, we upvoted them. And this was one of our initiatives that the group has been working on. So Fight CRC um, 
and several mem has has a, a group that works also on family history and early onset colon cancer. And many of those individuals are also NCCRT members. Um, and they developed a white paper on the topic of universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. And it has been submitted to um, the College of Surgeons who um, um, runs the Commission of, on Cancer for consideration as an accreditation standard. Um, so organizations can sign on in support of the topic on the Fight CRC website. Um, and I realized I hadn't asked NCCRT to sign on yet. And NCCRT can't always sign on to everything because they are an organization of organizations and they can't always speak for all of their member organizations. So kind of it's touchy what things they can and can't sign on to. Um, but your own organization is welcome to sign on and support. And so I've given the URL here um, and your organization can sign on in support of the white paper. We thought that that might further, we're, we're also trying to get a meeting with the College of Surgeons. Um, unfortunately, when we, reached out to them in the spring, they had just released the new accreditation standards. And I guess it's a two year process. Um, so we kind of had just missed a cycle. So they aren't in any hot hurry, um, but we have um, submitted it. We're trying to get meetings with them. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, all of the community cancer centers really strive to get COC accreditation. One of the things that drove a lot of community um, cancer centers to start having um, access to a genetic counselor was a COC standard was adopted, an accreditation standard that they had to either have a cancer genetic counselor on staff or have a relationship with one who they could refer to. That standard now has even been increased more stringently and you have to um, present data every year on a tumor type that's supposed to be referred to genetics and how many of them and what percent were actually referred. And then as an optional metric, you can present how many were actually seen. Um, so these standards actually carry a lot of weight. And I think this would go a long way towards reaching our goal of um, promoting universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. And then lastly, we have um, continued to support the AGA, the, the American Gastroenterolo Gastroenterology Association in the College of uh, Anatomical Pathologists, so AGA and CAP, had proposed a Medicare merit-based incentive payment measure again around universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. There was a comment period last December and um, it then there was a comment period actually in February as well. Um, my uh, liaison from CAP tells me that the um, MAP coordinating committee almost always accepts the recommendation of the clinician work group and we made it through that evaluation. So apparently this is in the process of also potentially being adopted and so, these are measures hospitals can choose to um, submit data on, um, and it has to do with whether they get full reimbursement for Medicare services or partial reimbursement, um, how well they do on these measures. So again, these are kind of um, carrot and stick measures to entice hospitals to do universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. Um, next slide. And another thing that NCCRT started this year was Blue Star Conversations. And I was honored to give the first one this year um, where I presented on uh, what proportion of early onset colorectal cancer is potentially preventable based on family history and genetics. So that was back in March. Um, and this was the first one we had. And they, these are gonna be um, each hosted by one of the NCCRT strategic priority teams. So this was the one our group hosted. Um, and they include a brief, timely, topical presentation, 15 to 20 minutes, followed by small group discussions among participants and sharing of key takeaways with the larger group. We had 66 attendees for that first one, which was really good, we thought, um, for a new program. And 91% of respondents indicated they learned something new and 100% indicated they felt the session was well organized and would recommend it to a colleague. Um, so we will um, uh, need to submit another topic, I suppose, for next year for our group. Um, and next I will, uh, I see we have Christine who from Northwell who is going to present 
um, some research she and I did, did together on advanced polyp prevalence among first degree relatives over early onset colon cancer patients. Thanks, Christine. Great, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm here to present uh, a little snapshot of uh, some work that we did with advanced colorectal polyps. And this work really started uh, with the late Dennis Onan and conversations with Heather Hempel um, and thinking about this patient population um, who is at risk for colorectal cancer and polyp development. And these are patients, these are these are otherwise healthy individuals who have a first degree relative that was diagnosed with a colorectal polyp. And not just any polyp, but what we're calling an advanced colorectal polyp, which is any polyp that's a centimeter in size, um, bilis histology, um, some serrated lesions uh, with cytological dysplasia, and really trying to inform um, the relatives of these patients. Um, about earlier screening. The US MSTF and NCCA guidelines state that screening should begin at 40 or earlier for close relatives, parents, siblings, children of patients with this diagnosis. Um, and we had an opportunity to really look at the impact of, of screening in this population and the importance of, the, of this younger group um, being screened appropriately um, especially in the prevention of early onset colorectal cancer. And we had access to a very unique cohort and a large cohort of early onset colorectal cancer patients through um, the Ohio uh, Colorectal Cancer Prevention Initiative, and then specifically through Heather's um, uh, universal screening for Lynch syndrome arm of that study, where there were uh, 536 patients identified who had no family history of colorectal cancer and no inherited germline mutation that was known. So we had this large population of otherwise sporadic early onset disease, and we wanted to see if their family members, um, it, it, if they had family members with this advanced colorectal polyp diagnos diagnosis, and if they were screened according to the guidelines, could their cancer, their early cancer have been prevented? And so this question, um, uh, next click please, um, was really trying to understand the prevalence of advanced colorectal polyps in this population, because this is a largely unknown, um, the, the answer to this is, is unknown. We know that about 30% of patients have some type of hereditary or family history associated cancer, um, but the percent of family history of advanced polyps or advanced adenomas is still unknown. We think it's at least 14%, but it could be 20%. And if you click again, it could be more, maybe it's 30%. And the more that we increase this piece of the pie, that leads a lower number that are due to sporadic cases and, and largely unknown. So if we can think about strategies for prevention, um, this study was really what we thought a critical next step in really understanding the impact of, of post-colonoscopy communication and patients understanding their risk, not just of family history of colorectal cancer, but a family history of polyps. So the next slide. So we uh, designed a study um, where we contacted all of the 536 early onset uh, cases. Um, these were all under 50 years of age. There was a percentage of this population that was deceased. Um, we were able to contact their next of kin if we weren't able to contact the proband directly. And we recruited this population through emails, uh, letters in the mail, and then follow-up phone calls. And one of the main outcomes of the recruitment of this, of this proband group was to collect their first degree relative information. And we wanted to contact all of their FDRs um, and any FDR that was over 18 years of age um, and had a colonoscopy prior to their the proband's diagnosis was in, is eligible for the study. And we wanted to contact the FDRs so that we could ultimately collect their colonoscopy reports if they had one prior to the proband's diagnosis. So the FDRs were contacted if the proband said, yes, I know my, my relative had a colonoscopy for sure. Or if the proband said, you know, I'm not sure, we still contacted that FDR to verify if they had a colonoscopy prior to the proband's diagnosis. And we had a number of ways that they were recruited through emails and, and, and letters in the mail, phone calls. And then the next click, please. We collected, we called all of these FDRs and we collected their colonoscopy reports 
Um, so we had um, any colonoscopy report that was performed prior to the proband's diagnosis was collected. And uh, we had a number of of sort of intricate recruitment methods because they needed to sign uh, medical release forms um, that were associated with the endoscopy practice. And uh, we had our team here at Northwell really lead the collection of those data. We had colorectal surgeons and uh, general surgery and colorectal surgery residents on board. Um, the Ohio, and I should have said from the very beginning, this was a collaboration between the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center and Heather's team and our team here at Northwell and the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research. So the OSU team was really responsible for that very first contact with the probands um, because they originated at uh, the OSU Medical Center. We felt that that was the most natural approach for those patients to be, you know, at least first contacted by an Ohio State personnel. And then our group at Northwell then were responsible for contacting the FDRs and then, uh, as I mentioned, we had a team of clinicians on our end collecting the colonoscopy reports. Next slide. And so our overall aims of this, of this project were really to uh, determine the feasibility of recruiting the early onset colorectal cancer probands under 50, determine the feasibility of contacting their FDRs, and then determine the feasibility of collecting colonoscopy reports. And the study, the study that we proposed actually initially started with, you know, we want to establish the prevalence of advanced adenoma in this young uh, early onset population. Um, but we had a little difficulty getting the right power um, to, to conduct that study. And also the study was funded by the Fight Colorectal Cancer Foundation. And there was just some concern and, you know, rightly so with trying to get the manpower to conduct this study. And so we really started with a feasibility approach. And that's why our aims are really focused on feasibility outcomes. Um, we did have a few secondary aims that had to do with the length of time to obtain the electronic medical records, um, the accuracy of self-report of colonoscopy results, and then the reasons um, like the facilitators and barriers um, for participation in the study. So our results uh, found that of our 536 probands, about 30% of that cohort was deceased. Um, of the 536, 113 or 21% of probands agreed to participate and were enrolled in our study. And then of, that, of those 113, 67 completed the survey. And this was the survey that asked them to provide the names of their relatives, their contact information, and, and this is where we lost a little bit of um, headway with the probands because some did not want to provide that information. Um, and then 67 probands that completed the survey provided the names of 280 first degree relatives. That was about four relatives per, pro per proband. So our response rate in the, in, in the total population was 12.5% among all, all probands. When it came to the FDRs, we contacted all 280. Um, only 114 were eligible that met our eligibility criteria of being over 18 and had a colonoscopy before the probands diagnosis. 37 of those were enrolled, um, and then 30 of those 37 completed the survey. And it was interesting, and you can see from these numbers, that the relatives were a little more motivated to complete the surveys than the probands themselves. Um, so we found that to be a, a bit of an interesting finding. Um, and then of the uh, number of FDRs enrolled, 30 percent, uh, sorry, 30 of those completed the survey. So there was about a 26 percent response rate among FDRs. So that was about a little more than twice as, as high as the response rate among probands. Um, the colonoscopy collection rate was actually quite good. Um, 81 percent of the first degree relatives provided their colonoscopy history information. And the length of time to obtain the colon colonoscopy and pathology reports from the from when we received the information was about six six or seven days so we had a really good turnaround time in terms of collecting those data okay next slide so another uh just quick point about the results um when we wanted to really look at the proportion of advanced adenomas among the first degree uh, family members um, we really needed to determine the number of complete families, because you can imagine if we had all these FDRs um, and we didn't have all the first degree relatives in their family, any missing person 
would really skew our results. Um, so we really had to determine how are we going to define a complete family? So we defined a complete family if any of the following were true. If there was at least one advanced adenoma in any FDR, we, we called that a complete family. If all FDRs were ineligible, that was also a complete family. And if the contact with all FDRs provided in the original Ohio study um, was available, unless anyone was missing under the, uh, under the age of 18, we still counted that as a complete uh, family. And then if no FDRs had a colonoscopy that was self-reported by the proband, we also um, included them in that same category of complete families. A family was incomplete if there was any FDR not accounted for, if they declined or were unable to reach, if they didn't provide the contact information for all the relatives, um, if they were lost to follow-up, or if there was any uh, FDR that was adopted, because we really just wanted uh, blood relatives um, because of the familial influence. Uh, next click. And so what we found among you know, our total universe was 536 probands. We had 280 FDRs. So we ended up with all those data we had collected, we had contacted every single one of those people. We only had 11 complete families and we only found three advanced polyps. Um, so we're, we just want to be a little cautious with the results because three out of 11 is about 27%. And to say that the prevalence of advanced adenomas among this EOCRC co cohort may not be 100% accurate until we really have more numbers and are able to recruit a, a proper study size. Um, so some of the key, just key barriers um, in the study that we found, refusal to provide contact information, some probands and in, in FDRs had no time, no interest in participating, um, discomfort in participating on behalf of deceased family members. This was for the next of kin that were contacted on behalf of the probands. Um, lack of information on colonoscopy history. You know, and this is quite common. Some people just didn't have that information. And then some colonoscopy reports were inaccessible due to um, the facility record keeping length. So the original cohort was enrolled between 2013 and 2017. So by the time we started this study, which was the which was in 2019, um, they had already expired in terms of keeping some of those records. Uh, so the next slide. Um, so our summary next steps, future studies with prospective um, uh, prospective study design will likely help improve uh, recruitment rates and data collection rates. Uh, we're really focused on next steps related to post colonoscopy communication of, among close relatives of the advanced colorectal polyp patients. Um, so not just counseling patients who are diagnosed with cancer on contacting their relatives, but really counseling advanced polyp patients following colonoscopy to talk to their siblings, call their brothers and sisters, um, and tell their children, um, and finding ways that we can integrate some of this information into the electronic medical record um, and create a flagging system um, so for this, this uh, for identifying these patients. And then um, this will continue to be a priority area for, for early onset colorectal cancer prevention research, just because such, such little information is known about the causes of this disease and getting family members screened early and on time at 40 if it's necessary can at least um, help to prevent some of those early uh, cases under 50. So right now we're in the process of finalizing our manuscript. We're planning to submit a brief communication to gastroenterology this year. Uh, next slide. And just a quick acknowledgement to the entire team that has worked on this study. As you can imagine, there are so many, uh, so many steps, a lot of effort required, a very time consuming study. And uh, our team at Ohio State, our clinicians, Heather's team, um, her scientists and researchers and uh, project managers and coordinators at Ohio State were, were critical. And then our team at Fight CRC for helping us to, to, to move the study forward and supporting our efforts. So thank you all for your time today. Thanks, Christine. Now we'll turn it over to Michelle. I think Michelle's gonna share her slides and she's gonna um, update us on the outcomes of the market research that um, she just did with our team. Um, this will also be presented at the annual meeting, um, but it's in a 
session where there are several things happening at the same time. So we wanted to make sure everyone in this group got to hear it um, because you guys were so involved from the beginning of uh, this process. So thanks, Michelle. All right. Um, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, it's great to, to see a lot of familiar names. Uh, I know we've been working through this research um, for a couple of years now. So just to kind of give a recap of um, the research we did for the um, early messaging, we did three phases of research. Um, in September of 2021, we did the first phase, which was a 15-minute unbranded online survey um, with 700, almost 750 individuals between the ages of 20 to 49. Um, none of them were screened, had been screened for colon cancer. In phase two, we did some qualitative research. So we did 15 um, one hour long, one-on-one -on -one interviews, again, with those ages 20 to 49 who had not been screened for colon cancer. Uh, and really the purpose of this first two phase was to kind of understand the current state of this audience. What do they know and how do they feel about colorectal cancer and colorectal cancer screening? Um, additionally, we just wanted to tap into their attitudes and behaviors with regard um, to health and how they prefer to receive healthcare information, who they trust to give it to them, so that when we do message to them, um, we know the proper channels. Um, phase three, we um, tested 12 different messages to target this audience to understand which messages would most likely motivate um, individuals to get screened on time. For colon cancer. So that was phase three, and we'll present the results um, for that as well. So um, just to summarize what we've learned um, from all three phases. So um, we asked top of mind, when you hear colon cancer, what comes to mind? Um, and the audience, you know, deadly, fatal disease, scary, terrible, um, pain and discomfort, those came to the top. Um, we did hear you know, the typical misinformation and assumptions that people make. So it's only for men or it's just, you know, something that happens to older people. So there was misinformation peppered into those responses as well. Similarly, we asked them, when you think of colon cancer screening, what comes to mind? Colonoscopies were at the top. Um, then it was digital rectal exams was next, most common. And then the third was just scary and nervousness. So when they think of colon cancer screening, there's a sense of um, apprehension. They're scared, they're nervous. Um, and we know when we talk to those who are of age to be screened that haven't yet, that fear is a key barrier. So it's something to keep in mind as well when messaging to this younger audience. And then one in 10 were honest. They said they haven't really thought about it. Nothing, nothing's really coming to mind for them. Um, as part of this research, we did reach out to some of the, we reached, you know, the audience had some of those that had a family history of colon cancer. So one in 10 of the individuals we spoke individuals we spoke to had a family history of colon cancer. We did have some people mentioned that they may have a family history and not even know it. Um, you know, noting that there's cultural taboos and families not really talking about health issues and things like that. Um, but among those with the family history, so less than half have even discussed their family history with a healthcare provider. So not just not surprisingly, only one in five have discussed screening with a healthcare provider. And when asked what their plans are to get screened for colon cancer, uh, three in 10 plan to wait for their healthcare provider to bring it up. If their healthcare provider doesn't bring it up, they're not, they're not gonna proactively bring it up. Um, the majority admit to being scared of the actual procedure um, to test for colon cancer. So again, we see fear kind of popping up into the emotions of this audience. Um, we have nearly three in 10 saying they're just too young, haven't given any thought. Um, one in five feel embarrassed talking about it. So again, those with the family history, they're embarrassed to even, even talk about it. Um, but to put some you know, positive spin on this um, as well, the majority do know that the recommended screening age is 40 or earlier. So they know um, it's younger for those with the family history. When we ask the audience um, what they thought the recommended age to get screened, for colon cancer for average risk individuals, so those that don't have a family history and don't have any symptoms, only 14% um, said age 45. So you're probably thinking, well, the guidelines only changed a few years ago. Most people probably said 50. We had just as many people saying less than 45 as we did saying 
over 45. So really the, the responses were all over the place. And what it boiled down to is this younger audience just doesn't know what the, what the recommended age is. Um, but most agree, everyone should get screened when they reach the recommended age. We did present them, you know, with the age, we said 45 is the recommended age. And we asked, knowing this, what do you think people should do? And the audience was pretty split. We had half who said people should just get screened whenever their healthcare provider recommends it. And then a little less than half that said they think people should follow, you know, the guidelines and start at age 45. In our audience, um, at least for phase one research, we had those that were at the recommended age or older, so those 45 to 49. Uh, and we asked them, you know, when we looked at what their thoughts are, four in 10 plan to wait for their healthcare provider to bring it up. They're not going to bring it up. So they know that they're at the age, still going to just wait for their healthcare provider. So it really kind of shows how critical, um, you know, healthcare providers' endorsements are. Um, However, most of this younger audience, um, they note that it is, they agree it's important to increase awareness of colon cancer and colon cancer screening. They acknowledge that it's probably more prevalent than they know, but it's not as publicized or talked about as much as cancers. We heard a lot about breast cancer. They hear a lot of that. Um, and so they agree it's important. Um, and they also agree that people should be educated long before they reach the recommended age. So the audience is receptive to learn more and know more um, and, and find that it's important that they do. So what messaging messages will resonate with the younger audience? So 12 messages with a variety of themes, themes as such as, as the preventable nature, family history, being proactive about their health, um, were tested using an advanced analytical technique um, called uh, MaxDiff to identify which messages would have the greatest impact on encouraging um, the younger audience to get screened for colon cancer on time. So the results, so this um, is a bit overwhelming. There's a lot a lot of numbers on here. Um, but this first column, so when we look at this chart, um, this is what we call a share of preference. It's what we've used to identify the winners in past research. Um, you might look at these numbers and be like, well, 14% is really low. What share of preference is, is it's how much more motivating is this message versus the others in the list? So when you look at these ones at top, so this eat well, work out regularly, don't smoke, this message, um, and then colon cancer being a silent disease, these are deemed the top messages. And they are, if you look down below, you know, in some cases, more than three times more motivating than the other messages down below here. So um, just focus on that they, they are at the top, there's a big gap between them and the bottom messages. Um, and so these two are the winners. Um, and I will read the messages really quickly because um, I know it's been a while since we crafted it. So the eat well message um, is eat well, work out regularly, don't smoke. What else? You're taking all the right steps to live a healthy lifestyle, but are you missing one step that might be easier than you think? Talk to your doctor to find out it's time to get screened for colon cancer and what screening options are right for you. So that's that's a top message. Um, this message, colon cancer is often a silent disease. Usually there are no symptoms. That's why getting screened is so important. It can help prevent colon cancer or catch it early when it's easier to treat. Most people should begin screening at age 45. Um, what's unique here? So as I said, we look at, at this chart to identify the winner, the share of preference, how much more motivating it is compared to others. But we also calculate, we call um, the percent rank top three. So if we're going to take everybody's numbers and we're going to and they rank them, how often do these messages end up in in their top three? And so here, when you look over here, colon cancer being a silent disease, that's in the top three for nearly half the respondents. It's lower for this this message that wins out a little bit on share of preference, which which people look at and like, well, that's that's kind of confusing. What it means though is that this eat well message. It wasn't in the top three didn't touch as much of an audience as the silent disease did. But when it was in the top three, it was normally number one. So those that this message resonates with, we call them they're passionately motivated by it. It really touched them. The silent disease message is also a, a good message, top performer, definitely want to use it. It wasn't ranked as a top one as often as some other messages. So that's what the disconnect is here. Two other messages we want to highlight as well are 
um, the two messages that frame it and talk about it being the leading cause of cancer-related death in the younger audience or it being on the rise among young adults. These also performed well um, in the top three and, and shouldn't be discounted because they can identify with it. So when we look at people that read that these messages resonated with, they could see themselves in it. And we've seen that in past research as well. Um, you know, we did we just did similar research among African Americans who had been unscreened. And the messages where they can identify it, they can see themselves in it, um, were really powerful as well. So channels for communicating um, CRC screening information. Um, half prefer to receive screening information from healthcare providers. Um, and again, with most of these respondents below the recommended age, these conversations haven't happened yet. They have not discussed screening with their healthcare provider. Beyond healthcare providers, other top channels um, include websites, online patient portals, emails. So really, you know, the digital um, forms of communication are will work well with this audience. The other thing we want to point out is social media. So it's not a preferred channel. It didn't pop as a preferred channel for receiving healthcare information. Um, but as most of this younger audience, they are using some form of social media. Um, we have uh, YouTube is actually the top platform used by 20 to 29 year olds. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then Facebook leads among those 30 years of age and older. So it's it's definitely a viable channel for reaching and educating the younger audience, even though it's not their preferred channel. They're on it. It'll reach to them. And then who they trust to give them information. So again, um, doctors and other healthcare providers, highly trusted, um, but also national health organizations like the ACS and government health organizations aren't far behind. Um, and so, um, and so they're, you know, they're trusted sources as well. But again, this just reiterates that healthcare providers will be a key component to helping um, educate this younger audience, getting the conversation started. Um, but also content, whether it's on websites or advertisements, social media, um, that's backed by national health organizations or government health organizations will hold a lot of weight with this audience as well. Um, so I, I know I went through that pretty quickly. Um, I, we want to make sure we leave time for discussion. Um, but any any questions? Um, any questions on this research? Michelle, yeah, we oh, there we go. Yeah, hey, Whitney Jones here. Um, any idea on the, the time of implementation to make sure we're picking up those people those twenty percent of people who are needing to be screened at forty or sooner, uh, did we get any flavor for how acceptable this message was in the thirties, say versus the early forties? And then also, any any ideas around the frequency of times they have to hear this message before you can see some sustained behavioral response? Thank you. Yeah. So, so that was not tested tested in this research. That would really require um, additional research to kind of understand that level. And, and honestly, we're, this was the voice of the patient, right? Or the voice of the 20, 20 year olds, they're not gonna know, right? How how early they need to be reached. Um, I know there's like, there's quite a bit of publications out there that have recommended how many times information needs to hit someone before it resonates with them, but um, that can't be answered by this research. So we wanted to open up the discussion, obviously, please continue with any questions you have for Michelle um, about what to what to do with this information, right? So we, we have this information now, what are the next steps um, our strategic priority team can do to kind of, you know, synthesize this information um, and utilize it in an effort to um, get information out to these 20 to 49 year olds who clearly don't know the start age for colonoscopy um, and very clearly also would prefer their healthcare provider to tell them when to start their colon screening. Um, so I think there's a lot of lessons that we can pull out of this data. And we'd love to, everybody's input over the next sort of 10 minutes into next steps. 
while while people are thinking of questions and putting stuff in the chat, Caitlin, can you remind me you've done um, key message research before about um, colon cancer in general and screening for colon cancer in general? Um, what products did we produce from that those research studies? Yeah, absolutely. And I can put some links in the chat in just a moment for everyone. But um, you know, starting in 2014 and really releasing guidebooks in 2017, we have messaging guidebooks focused on the unscreened population. Um, in 2019, we have an updated messaging um, communications guidebook, which I highly recommend looking at if you haven't. And then just this past year, we released a messaging guidebook focused on Black and African-American adults who haven't yet been screened for colorectal cancer. So again, a bit of a different population. Everybody was of screening age. So we're looking at, you know, how do you get people ready for screening, um, depending on whether they're average risk or not. Um, but we really see this, uh, I mean, what we really wanna do is obviously build a messaging guidebook out of this phenomenal research. Um, and we wanna make sure that um, the suite of our materials continues to grow. So, you know, one of the things we're looking to do is to produce a guidebook, but also focus on dissemination and making sure it's utilized and then hearing from our partners, how they're utilizing it and if it's effective. Hi everybody, it's Steve. Sorry I came late, I'm on the inpatient teaching service. Um, thank you all for attending and thanks for the presentations. I'm wondering, Michelle, you know, it, it looked as if the messaging lines that you talked about at the bottom of the list were uh, was having a family history. It didn't seem as if having a family history was all that motivating for this young population. Am I interpreting that correctly? Because that's kind of scary. We've always assumed that if you have a family history, you're going to be more nervous the younger you are, you know, in, in in at a younger age than the general population. But yet it looked as if your research showed that it wasn't that motivating. So I think it's important to keep in mind that there was only 10% of the audience had a family history, right? So they're not going to be, and what we looked at was in total, they're not going to be fully represented there. We did, we do have a cut in the report um, where we, we show what messages were most motivating among those with the family history. Um, it being a silent disease was number one. And then behind it, it was one of the messages, um, of course, <laughs> of course, my PowerPoint is frozen right now. Um, it was one of the messages about it being on the rise in young adults. So to your point, the fear element, like they're, they're a young adult, they have a family history, that's resonating with them. It being a silent disease, that's resonating with them more so than just a message that says, if you have a family history, go get screened. I have a quick question, Michelle. Um, when you said four out of 10, uh, would wait for their clinicians to suggest getting screened. Does that mean that six out of 10 would advocate for themselves? Or I just was wondering where the other numbers fell. Um, there's a mix. There's some that said they'll bring it up. There's some that said they're not going to do it. Um, so it, it was a mix. Yep. Um, Michelle, hello everyone. I'm Mindy Conklin. I'm new to NCCRT. Really happy to be here today. Um, I have a quick question in regards to the messaging. Mm -hmm. um, were they reading these messages off a piece of paper? Where are those messages coming from? Because our we're getting some success with actually having twenty something speak to the twenty something. So I wasn't mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Yep. So tell me. Yeah. Okay. So from from the message standpoint, mm -hmm. they were it was programmed on a computer screen. So they took the survey on their computer, but we only exposed them to three messages at a time. So the advanced analytic tool showed them a series of screens. Each one had three messages on it. They picked the most motivating. They picked the least motivating, and they repeated that exercise um, over and over again across I think uh, ten or eleven screens. Um, so that's that's how they they resonated with it. But again, those messages where they can identify with someone, um, definitely receiving that information from somebody their age mm -hmm. would be impactful. And we know that from other research we've done as yeah. well. Yeah, okay, thanks. Another thought that came to my mind is, you know, it, it, it seems to be that when the message is coming from the, physician or the healthcare team, that resonates the most. Um, but I, I wonder in this young population, how many people are literally seeing a doctor on a regular, you know, if you're in your 30s or maybe even early 40s, um, do we have a sense from this population that you engaged, 
are these people that are more health conscious and seeing their doctors regularly or uh, do we have any sense as to how representative this sample might be? So part part of the research we did, and again, we only had 10 minutes um, to present it, we did ask them, and most of this audience does see their doctor regularly for checkups and physicals. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're in there. But again, I mean, based on their age, it's not, it's not being brought up and um, they're not getting questioned on if they have a family history of colon cancer. Um, so. I think that's a great point, Steve. I, I, I'm with you. I sort of don't see people outside of routine, you know, young female care having regular PCPs in their 20s, even 30s. That's a surprising sample. Yeah. So, in it, it, so I guess is the plan, Caitlin, to make one of these messaging guide books like you've done for the other projects, and and I a follow up question: Have we ever published this research in the medical literature? Right, because I think that this is the kind of thing we might want to get in front of primary care physicians if we could. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, so we, yes, our goal is within the early part of next year is to produce a communications guidebook focused on this research. So I'd really, um, I really rely on this group um, to find volunteers to help us build an advisory committee. We, all, we obviously had an advisory committee for the research, but I think in the development of this guidebook, um, having y'all's direction would be incredibly helpful. And I will say with our, our other recent market research focused on Black and African-American adults, um, we did work with ABGH, the Association of Black Gastroenterologists and Hepatologists, to draft a manuscript, and we're actually looking to publish wow. the manuscript. Uh, we're, we're kind of shopping around right now. So that is something that I think would be um, really wonderful to explore. Um, obviously, we would need to look into, you know, potential authors and things like that, but I think this group would um, be great to kind of dig into that. I wonder, Steve, I'm thinking of how successful the Yoka project was with, gosh, I'm trying to think that wasn't even a GI fellow, was it? That was like a pre-med student. It was our medical first student. author. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Parth. Yeah, Jay, Parth is, right? Yeah, he was a medical yeah. student. He's now an intern. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, maybe we could get someone to take the lead as, as a project like that into writing it up. I, 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 do feel like maybe getting it both in the guidebook format, but also into the literature would be helpful for getting as many eyes on it as possible. Yeah, I even envision, this is Paul, I, I envision there are possibly two manuscripts here if uh, we can find a, a willing individual or group to draft them. One would be just the survey data, interview data, and then the messaging piece of it, because it really is eye-opening. You know, we knew there's opportunity here to educate the public, but I didn't, I don't think we were aware of how much need there is um, until we got some of that feedback. So I think both, you know, looking forward and publishing something in, in, in the medical literature would be valuable as well as, you know, developing this guidebook. And, and Paul, the ongoing need to educate the physician. <laughs> yes. I mean, the other thing that is sort of eye-opening. This relates to Whitney's belief that a lot of this lead time messaging um, should occur at the, uh, there should be a sort of a grassroots movement to sort of seek information and, and get screened appropriately. But it looks like we really need to target both audiences since so many of these individuals do still rely on their physicians to bring up the topic. So again, building what Jay just said about educating the providers. Yeah, that's what really struck me. And also the the very small percentage of people who knew what the proper age for screening was. I mean, again, education, education, education. Yeah, I and then when told that it was 45, if they were 45 to 49, yeah. still, still needed yeah. to hear it from their doctor. <laughs> yeah, that, that really, um, I didn't know whether to be surprised, disappointed, or both with that. I know. Um, yeah. Even though 76% said you should start when it's recommended. <laughs> Wait, age yeah. Start. I, yeah. And here they are at the recommended age to start. <laughs> that's I right. still need to hear from my doctor. <laughs> hey, Steve, that's for the other person, right? I, mean, <laughs> I, I wanted to add too, I think, um, I think this research is really interesting. And I think, I think it'll really have a lot of impact on our membership of the round table and, and beyond that. Because I, I think it'll open some eyes. I think there's probably some follow-up questions as that we'll want to ask as like a family history and early age onset 
group. So I think, you know, the next steps are probably, they're pretty routine what we do. We put it together a messaging guidebook. We've delivered this both in PDF format. We've also delivered this in digital formats. So we have this NCCRT learning center that we can kind of put them on as well, uh, which is just a different way to deliver this education to our members and to professional folks. Other guidebooks have had a little bit more resourcing to kind of put together some different um, collateral, communications collateral with it. So I, you know, I don't know if we're quite ready for that with this research yet, but I think, you know, what, one thing to remember was we had a lot of questions and we were making a lot of assumptions with this market research, and this is why we we did it. And now we're kind of seeing where our, our fears are only maybe <laughs> exacerbated and then also where we were kind of got it right and where, you know, we, we are and are not um, surprised by the information. So I think, you know, we left some stuff on the table for research questions and and finding out more ways to tackle this. I'm not sure, you know, Dr. Jones, I know you all maybe in Kentucky did a little bit something in this area, but you know, generally this is this is um, as as far as being specific to colorectal cancer is is good research that I think there's more avenues to to press. Agreed. So maybe that's a, a, an issue for discussion of figuring out like what are those next questions? What didn't we get to cover in this? What does what still is left begging to be answered? And kind of all going back to the original editorial that was put together, whatever you guys commentary that Dr. Jones, Dr. Shroy, and Dr. Ryan all put together on this. I think that's what mm -hmm. right. And, and that's a great point, Caleb. And just to springboard off of that, um, I want to remind everybody that this group will meet in person at the annual meeting in Lock Raven number two. Um, that's going to be next Wednesday from 3.30 to 5. Unfortunately, our wonderful chairs, uh, Dr. Roy and Heather Hamper, won't be able to be there, but we've recruited uh, Dr. Itzkowitz and Caleb, so uh, you can look forward to them uh, moving forward this conversation. Yeah, and you don't want to disappoint us. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I get. Caleb did it on purpose because I was so adamant about this group meeting. I was like, this is like our biggest group, like our most active group. We got. I can't imagine an annual meeting without you guys getting together. So <laughs> no. and like, well, great, then you, you help run it. Could I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Hey, um, great, great efforts, amazing. But you know, I was just at this other health equity fair and they were talking about African Americans and the incredible risk of, you know, endometrial cancer, prostate cancer, um, and other cancers. And it was brought up again and again about this barrier of fear. And so, how do we? You, you, we've identified that they, that came out, but how do you take steps in terms of beyond education? But and that's different in different cultures. But how do you get to this fear element? You know that. It's just better not to know. It's better not to test. You know, how do you get over that? I think, in my experience, uh, I think a lot of peer education. You know, people that have had a colonoscopy themselves, or people that have actually gone through colon cancer treatments. Um, you know, I, I, I we talk about celebrities. You know, talking, but I think more than that, I think it's like people on the ground who have witnessed it. Because you know, you can hear it all the time from a doctor or a nurse, but. I have a feeling the patient's still sitting there saying, yeah, it's easy for you to say you're the doctor, you know, um, but I think if, if I think it's peer peer education, frankly. Well, and I think it's not just the fear of the colonoscope, you know, it's the fear of what's the colonoscope going to show. You what, know, what are yeah. you going to find? Yeah. yeah. What are you going to find? I mean, that's what I think is driving it more than just the, you know, what we know is not invasive, but what might be part of the barrier is just the, the test itself, but the results of the test. But, you know, there's a lot of patient navigators now around the country, and uh, I know certainly with our patient navigators, they are trained to address those kinds of questions. You know, when people, when they're navigating people in for colonoscopy, it comes up, you know, I'm afraid that you're going to find a cancer, you know. So, um, yeah, it's a good question. I think we really need to be intentional about that. I think we have to think about strategies to really... Um, up front, you know, deal with that. Thank you, Beth. That's a. It's almost like the little Cologuard guy, you know, that you show a little polyp and say, but if you find this early, you can cure cancer. You know, it, it's like illustrating this this concept of the the, the 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 polyp that you can detect early on, you know, and just visualizing that in a way that they can grasp. So anyway, it's a good point. Hey, Steve, I just I love want the idea to uh, showing... <clears throat> Sorry, I want to add on to what you said, Steve. I, I think the the peer-to-peer -peer thing is so critical. I think I've, you know, as physicians, we've seen that happen so often. Um, a friend tells a friend and yeah, it wasn't so bad. And 
um, that that's that's the winning strategy in my mind. Yeah, I just gonna say that, having someone who looks like someone tell them that message and hey, I made it through it because of this. <clears throat> and remember, we're dealing with breast cancer as the ideal sort of hold it up high. They've been at it for 25, 30 years. It's going right. to take a lot of investment, but that's where we want to eventually end up with wide awareness across a broad range of people uh, and an acceptance level that's, that's, you know, not where we are now, but where we want to be. Right. You know, Whitney, just a lot of catching up to do, to your point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to get that's on right. the same level as breast cancer. Yep. Looks like Chris has her hand up. Yep. Yeah. I just wanted to add that one of the things, the fears that, I'm not quite sure how to deal with, but I've hearing it more and more often is not that I don't want to know I have cancer, but I'm never going to get an ostomy. So the taboo of the ostomy is driving the, the unwillingness to go find out and, and to that conclusion. Um, it's coming up more and more, and especially coming up in the African-American communities that I, I talk to. So I think that's something to address and I don't have an answer for it, but it is becoming a very common reaction. Well, I think I hate to uh, I know. cease our discussion, which now has generated so much passion and excitement. I do want to point out that Dennis Anand, being the visionary he was, he actually produced the PSA uh, as being you know, the importance of having a, a polyp survivor rather than a cancer survivor um, discussed the fact that they benefited from having the colonoscopy and that you know, they have their colon intact and they're not gonna die from colon cancer. We usually focus on colon cancer survivors to say they're glad they caught it earlier, but he always believed that we should pre be promoting the prevention concept as well, which builds perhaps into that whole fear issue. Um, so I think we, because of the, we're at the top of the hour that um, we'll probably stop here, but I wanna encourage everyone to do some homework, even though Heather and I will not be at the annual meeting. I really would hope that everyone gives what we heard today some, some thought and really come into the meeting with some ideas on what our action plan for next year will be, how to extend the work of the uh, lead time messaging project. Uh, certainly, we'd like to do the guidebook as well as perhaps generate some manuscripts. But we're also open to suggestions around other topics that you think may be relevant for this group to tackle in the coming year. So please give it some thought and come prepared to uh, share your ideas with the group. One last comment is that we encourage everyone to consider submitting a nomination for the 2023 80% in Every Community National Achievement Awards. And there is a, um, I don't know if the slide's up, but the final slide in the set just reminds you to go to the nccrt.org slash awards um, website if you have any recommendations or nominations. Heather, any final comments? No, thanks everybody. Uh, we'll miss you next week, but I'm sure Caleb and Steve will fill us in and we'll all leave um, re-energized for next year. Thank you, Paul and Heather. Thank you.